This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hello and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and it never got quiet. This is a half hour program that explores the Hawaiian connection with the Vietnam War. I'm your host, Vic Kraft. On August 22nd, 1864, 16 European nations adopted the first ever Geneva Convention. Its purpose was to establish some measure of control to an ever increasing scale of destruction and warfare. It was inspired by the work of Swiss businessman Jean-Henri Dunant. Dunant was on a business trip to Italy where he witnessed the carnage of the Battle of Solferino in 1859. He wrote a book titled, oddly enough, A Memory of Solferino. The book helped to create the International Committee of the Red Cross in 1863 and subsequently the Geneva Convention the following year. Part of the Geneva Convention established one member of the military organization as having a special and protected status on the battlefield. They have become known as the Combat Medic or Corpsman. They were there to save lives and alleviate the suffering of wounded and sick persons on the battlefield. Chapter 4, Article 25 of the Geneva Convention states, Members of the armed forces, specially trained for employment, should the need arise as hospital orderlies, nurses, or auxiliary stretcher bearers in the search for or the collection, transportation, or treatment of wounded and sick shall likewise be respected and protected if they are carrying out these duties at the time when they come into contact with the enemy or fall into his hands. Article 29 reads, members of the personnel des designated in Article 25 who have fallen into the hands of the enemy shall be prisoners of war, but shall be employed on their medical duties insofar as the need arises. According to the Geneva Convention, knowingly firing at a medic wearing clear insignia that he is a war, client, is a war crime. Combat medics or corpsmen are military personnel who have been trained to at least an emergency medical treatment level and are responsible for providing first aid and frontline trauma care on the battlefield. They are also responsible for providing continuing medical care in the absence of a readily available physician, including care for disease and battle injuries. Of all the jobs in the military, the combat medic or corpsman is probably the most respected. Our guest today is Alan Ho, former combat medic and now practicing attorney. Alan was drafted into the U.S. Army in 1966. He served in Vietnam during one of the more intensive periods of the war. Alan attended UH Manoa, earning a degree in political science, later earning his law degree. Alan has his own private practice and continues his association with the U.S. Army through several other organizations. He is also a member of the Honolulu Polo Club. Aloha, Alan. Hello. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much. It's uh, an honor to be here. Oh, it's an honor to have you here, uh, as I said being one of the professions in the military that is probably the most honored of all uh, in terms of rescuing people and putting yourself in, in the line of fire uh, and not being able to shoot back, legally anyway. Legally, you know, and uh, <laughs> listening to that explanation of Article 25, it just kind of, oh, somebody forgot to tell that to the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> it never stopped them from shooting at us. That's true. I can remember the number of dust-offs that were uh, yeah. shot at. Great big Red Cross and right. White Square and... Uh, uh, I can remember at one point in time they started putting M60s on the side of them. Absolutely, yeah. and 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 eventually, um, you know, the need for helicopter evacuation was so great that any any slick, armed or unarmed, in the area would drop in and pick up the wounded. A slick being uh, one of the helicopters. Yeah. Kind of helicopters yeah. Yeah, I, I was just curious. Uh, what unit were you attached to? I I was with the uh, I was. The reconnaissance platoon of 2nd Battalion, 1st Infantry Regiment 
of the 196 Light Infantry Brigade. Okay. And uh, the 196 Light Infantry Brigade, originally when organized in 1967, was part of what was called Task Force Oregon in the northern sector of Vietnam, and then ultimately was rolled into the 23rd Infantry Division. And, and subsequently also became the American. The American, actually yeah. the 23rd and the American. I'm yeah. sorry, it's, it's it's the same organization. Yeah. Yeah, it's a. Uh, yeah, the American Al had a uh, quite a reputation uh, in uh, as for as far as being uh, a great combat unit, right? And uh, very looked up to. Uh, I saw quite a few of the guys uh, with the little flashes on their uniforms when right. we were going out uh, out of country and uh, right. So it's, it's the blue shield. With the blue shield with the Southern Cross, yes, the four Southern stars Cross, representing right. yeah. the South Pacific. Yeah. You were in country, what, in 1968? 1967. I got there in December of 67 and then came home in ending part of uh, sep September 68. And you were located primarily where? In uh, the northern sector, uh, more commonly known or referred to as uh, Chulai, uh -huh. Tam Ki, yeah. and uh, uh, up in uh, way and as far north as um, Ashau Valley. So you kind of had an intermingling with with Marines as well. Then. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You know, it, in 1967, 1968, things were quite hectic. Mm -hmm. And the 196 Light Infantry Brigade was sort of referred to as the, the Orphan Brigade. So wherever uh, extra rifles were needed, uh, we would pick up and be sent there. Given that experience, I mean, you, uh, I, I don't want to dredge up bad memories or whatever, but I imagine uh, dealing with casualties uh, you must be suffering from mountains of PTSD. <laughs> you know, um, no, not really. I, 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 I have, I, I guess, have been was very fortunate to have been raised in a very um, um, uh, st strong family, mm -hmm. uh, and um, my my parents were very religious, were Christians. And so my upbringing provided me with a sense of, of, of strength, a, a sense of family. And of course, being part Native Hawaiian, it was always this, this sense of ohana. And so I, I always kind of viewed each incident, each um, uh, critical kind of moment where life and death hung in the balance as my role to do the best I could to sway the balance toward life. A couple of years ago, and we were talking about this, uh, I, I tried to uh, uh, get a documentary going on uh, Hawaiian veterans of the Vietnam War and their experience. And uh, we were searching for a title, and uh, uh, it finally ended up, uh, I'll see if I can mess sure. this up, Hepili uh, Vehena Ole. Right. Which, uh, meaning a relationship that cannot be undone. And considering what Hawaiians went through going to the mainland and going to uh, the training centers, mostly in the South, their experience had to have been somewhat different from mine, uh, especially coming from the mainland and uh, being a Haole. Uh, it, it, uh, I was treated differently. Now, I know you did not have that experience. Yours was uh, quite different, but uh, I, I'm sure that uh, this, this is kind of the acceptance that we were talking about as far as Ohio. And uh, it, coming here, it's, it's a different spirit. A much different spirit, and I think that the, we were we were going to get into that a little bit as far as your son and uh, uh, Hawaiian culture, and how it's it's. I think we have something unique to offer the world, in that uh, uh, we were talking about Hawaiian language and just the word aloha alone uh, has such a huge depth of meaning, not just as a greeting. Right, and you know Hawaiian cultural traditions they talk about uh, our our. Um, culture being uh, dualistic, mm -hmm. or as the Hawaiians refer to it uh, in, in terms of language and interpretations, the kaona, or the, the other, the hidden, hidden meaning. Mm -hmm. and, and so when, you know, when we use the term aloha, it, um, like you had pointed out earlier, like the Jewish or the Hebrew word shalom has an incredible breadth of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of acceptance and also in terms of um, uh, what it means mm -hmm. and how it how it is said between two individuals, or how is it how who are friends like old time friends, or how it may be shared with someone you just met for the first time. Mm. Yeah, I think that the Hawaiian culture has evolved uh, in, in, in terms of. Uh, I, I look at all of the Pacific Islands and, and uh, the language and how closely related uh, 
the tongues are between Tongan, Polynesian, uh, or Tahitian, and, and Hawaiian. But uh, again, going to this uh, concept of, of a relationship that cannot be undone. And uh, we talk so much about uh, the divisiveness in our society right, right now. And uh, I, you sent me the account of your son uh, in, in Mosul and in Iraq, and uh, we'll get into that in a minute, but it's just, it's, it's very stirring and very inspirational to see that there are still young people who believe in going into battle, going into war, right. and uh, taking up uh, the concept of fighting for this nation and fighting for what we believe in. And I, I thought that, uh, wow, it, it, at, at your son's funeral, the, 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 the outpouring uh, of people uh, that came and just even the tourists that came to see uh, see the funeral uh, it was just amazing. Whatever, as I told you, I, I wish I could have met him. Uh, he was just a phenomenal human being, which is, I guess, <laughs> a testimony to your raising a fine group of kids. Yeah, you know, he he was a remarkable young man. Uh, he, um, I think, like like his old man, and that was his kind of. He and I had this special connection that, you know, he used to introduce me to his friends as, this is my old man. And I'll tell you what, you know, some people may may view that as being somewhat disrespectful, but for me, that sent a real strong message that my son and I had a, had a deep personal connection, that he, uh, he felt proud enough of me to kind of share uh, his feelings with his friends. But he was a remarkable young man in terms of he understood, appreciated, and was an incredible student of history, culture, language, as well as, you know, his, his military heritage as well. Mm -hmm. And then for him, it, it kind of all blended together, and he um, uh, made a decision uh, at some point in time that he was going to uh, um, pursue that, 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 that um, that course, being a, being a warrior like his ancestors were. Mm -hmm. And of course, we will never know, uh, you know, if he was going to make this a career or, or not. But uh, in the few years that he was with us and that he uh, engaged in that activity, he left an incredible legacy uh, that to this day uh, is um, carried on by everyone who had uh, uh, the privilege to come in contact with him. Well, just reading the article that you sent me uh, that, that appeared, uh, what, in Welcome Home magazine, that uh, uh, the co some of the comments of the people that were in his platoon, yeah. uh, uh, Grant, I, I found it interesting that he enlisted, even though he had a degree, and uh, uh, worked his way up and immediately got commissioned, uh, or not immediately, but got commissioned. But uh, the impact that he had with the people around him, uh, and one of the people in there said that, oh, yeah, he probably would have made uh, commanding general of the Army or uh, chairman of, the, of, of a, maybe of the Joint Chiefs. Right. But he had that kind of mana as far as uh, yeah, walking he, into a room and understanding and, that yeah, he was in charge. And, and owning the room, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, and that period of time that he um, uh, served in the Army and, and the unit that he served with was an absolutely incredible um, period of time and a remarkable group of young men, uh, both enlisted who were his soldiers as well as those who were his leaders. Because you know his colonel that he served under in combat was is our now uh, four-star general Bob Brown from Userback. Mm. And um, and I look around the army today and I am absolutely astounded with the numbers of leaders or officers and enlisted men that my son served with who are now occupying incredible uh, roles of leadership within our country. Alan, we're going to get back to that in a little bit. Right now, let's take a couple of uh, minutes for some messages here. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Aloha, I'm Prince Dykes, the volunteer host of the Prince of Investing. Think Tech is important to me because it brings Hawaii's number one financial literacy show around the globe. For the first time, Think Tech Hawaii is participating in an online-based fundraising campaign to raise $40,000. Give thanks to Think Tech. will run only during the month of November, and you can help. 
Please donate what you can so that Think Tech Hawaii can continue to raise public awareness to promote civic engagement through free programming like mine. I've already made my donation and look forward to yours. Please send your tax deductible contribution by going to the website thinksforthinktech.causevox.com. On behalf of the community enriched by Think Tech Hawaii, 30 plus weekly shows, thank you, mahalo for your generosity. Welcome back to It Never Got Quiet. We're speaking today with uh, Alan Ho, uh, who was a combat medic in Vietnam, and uh, we were talking about his son, uh, Nainoa. Nainoa, yes. And uh, uh, you have this flag sitting here uh, on the table. Uh, can you tell me a little bit sure. about that? You know, this, this remarkable piece of cloth uh, is, I know for a fact, at least 50 years old, because that's how long it's been in my possession. And it, it is a flag that is faded. Um, the stars are kind of torn and, and worn. And the gold braiding is now um, almost a yellow. But um, in 1967, when uh, I joined my long range recon team, uh, we got this flag sort of as a talisman, you know, for no particular reason, other than uh, it, it was something to have. And mm -hmm. being, being a medic, I had kind of like the, the largest bag. And it, so, you know, th there was space in my bag to carry this ex extra flag. And, you know, we, I carried this flag with me for a good six months and um, kind of it just being there. And then in, on Mother's Day 1968, it took on a very special meaning yeah. when um, my unit got overrun and I lost 18 men on Mother's Day 1968. Now, if you talk about how horrible and what that m meant to the mother of one of my soldiers uh, who was killed on that day. Yeah. But subsequently, um, there were 10 of them that, of the 18 that were missing in action for up to 37 years. Um, but we promised that this flag would be presented to the family of my lieutenant who was missing in action, Fred Ransbottom from Edmond, Oklahoma. Um, and so uh, my two sons grew up knowing the history, the story of this flag, and, and its meaning to dad, and its meaning to uh, young soldiers. And so when Nainoa was uh, deployed to Iraq with his unit, um, he had shared the story with his, his young soldiers. And they said, sir, would you ask your dad to send us the flag, because we want to carry it in honor of the men that your dad served with in Vietnam. And at that time, in honor of his lieutenant, who was still missing in action. Oh, and you can imagine how proud that made me. Yeah. So, you know, I said, oh, my God, these young men, they, they understand, they got it. So I sent the flag to them, and they, they carried it in battle, especially, specifically in the battle for the city of Mosul in um, uh, 2004 and 2005. And the sad part of the legacy of this flag is that my son was carrying it the day he was killed in combat. Um, and subsequently, uh, the story or the legacy of this flag has just kind of grown by huge proportions. And subsequently, it has been on maybe five or six more deployments into combat by units affiliated with my son's unit simply because they knew the story and the legacy of this flag. So this flag has been in, uh, to Iraq five times and Afghanistan four times. It's literally flown the whole country of Afghanistan with the 25th Aviation uh, Combat Brigade, literally hundreds of thousands of miles. It's been around the world. And I think one of the unique aspects as it relates to Vietnam, this flag was on board the Kitty Hawk when it made its last sail oh. as a Navy carrier before it was sent back to the mainland for uh, deactiv deactivation, oh, yeah. Decom. And yeah, decom. So yeah, this is a very uh, special flag, Vic. And whenever I get the chance, I, I, I take it with me and I, I share it with the young soldiers and I say, here, take this. This flag has a lot of mana. It certainly does. Take some and give it some of yours. Yeah. And you know, uh, it brings me great joy to see the reverence in which these young warriors treat this this flag 
And I'm and I'm glad to see that there are still people out there like that. Oh yeah. And, and uh, as I said, it, it, it does my heart well because I think of the media portraying the divisiveness that is in this country, and yet we still have young men yeah. and women who will go out and sacrifice themselves. Yeah. For a piece a of cloth. Piece of cloth. A piece of cloth yeah. that is representative. Yeah. Of uh, of what we are and what we believe. Yeah. And I think that's amazing. And. Uh, I know that you've carried on uh, as far as with your time with the Army. Uh, you were explaining to me your position as you currently hold as, as in your relationship with the Secretary of the Army. Could you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, right. I, I have a very unique honor to be in a civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army. And uh, the Army is really the only service branch that has this program. And what it is is that there are 100 of us in the country, and uh, there's generally two per state, and our job is to serve as a liaison between uh, the Army and the community. And um, there's really no specific task that we're given other than to help facilitate good relationships, uh, help the Army to address issues that it may feel um, uh, they need special assistance as it relates to that community. And, and on the reverse to help our community kind of uh, adopt more open door policy with our military uh, families who live and reside in our communities. And I think for me, one of the, the not the biggest challenges, but one of, the, one of the things that I enjoy the most is, is engaging with soldiers who, uh, when they first come to Hawaii, to encourage them to, you know what, you need to live and serve your duty outside the wire. Because, mm. you know, you will discover when you go outside the wire that it is, this is anywhere USA. And, you know, over the years, I've, I've seen how that has evolved and how it's become a remarkable experience. Whereas before, young soldiers would kind of like hang out only together and stay on base or do things that only soldiers would do among themselves. But now you see them out in the community. They're engaging in programs in the, in the, in the schools to help repair, and they're actively now engaging in uh, surfing with, you know, some of our pro professional surfers on the North Shore, and of course the scuba diving and the uh, skydiving, and you know, things that we used to as young boys do a long time ago, <laughs> not so much these days. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, I think also too, we were talking about, uh, the, as your son uh, uh, promoted Hawaiian culture, and yeah. I think that, uh, uh, as again, we have a very unique society here in the islands, and uh, one of the things that uh, that struck me as being, uh, we, we both attended the uh, the ceremony at the uh, the 25th right. uh, of the, their deployment, uh, uh, their 50th anniversary of their deployment to Vietnam, and also uh, 75th, 75th birthday, 75th birthday of, yeah. of the unit yeah. standing up, and uh, it, it was very impressive for me to see all these young soldiers out there. Yeah. The, the the thing that got me was the haka that, yeah. that they did. Uh, that was unique to their unit, and how many of the of the of the kids out there? I, we call them kids, but yeah. uh, you know they're adults. And uh, but it was it was a very impressive ceremony, and uh, I, I felt very warm about the whole thing. I thought it was a great ceremony. Yeah. So I, I'm going to have to check my picture and make, make sure that you're I, in there. I know you're in there. I I, I was actually on the uh, the vehicle with uh, um, the reviewing of uh, of the uh, the troops that morning. Well, as I recall, we were all called out. Uh, no, no, be before I, oh, I reviewed. Oh, remember when, oh remember yeah. When, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. Uh, that was, again, that was a very impressive. As I said, uh, people are sitting there and talking about it. I said, look at all these soldiers. Said, yeah. yeah. That's only a third of them. Yeah, it's incredible. When yeah. you when you see a division online yeah. in, in, in formation, it is awe-inspiring. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. And, and again, uh, the dedication to these kids uh, is, is amazing. Yeah. Uh, Thank God for them. Thank God for that. And I want to thank you, uh, Alan. And uh, as I said, I have, I've met your son through his spirit, and I really appreciate that. Thank you for coming on the program. You're welcome. Journalism is not objective. No matter how hard we try, we all carry some amount of prejudice towards a topic. However, there can be alternative journalism where an issue can be discussed without rhetoric or animosity. I believe that this is what we have to offer here at Think Tech Hawaii. This media offers an opportunity to bring more than one perspective to the community. 
ThinkTech also provides information on a host of topics that can aid in improving your life. But all this costs money. We speak of free speech as one of our rights to our Constitution, but it requires maintenance. That maintenance has been measured in the lives of those who have defended it and by those who support efforts such as Think Tech Hawaii through their contributions. The staff here are not volunteers. They would like to continue to pay their rent. The hosts of the programs you watch are volunteers. We do this out of service to the community. So please contribute. The information to do how to do so is on the, on the, listed on the screen below. We'd love to have some feedback. If you have some comments, please send an email to 808-VIETNAMVETS gmail.com. I would like to thank the staff here at Think Tech Hawaii for all their support and assistance. Special thanks go to Ray and Robert, who go the extra mile. Truly without them, this program would not be possible. Please come back again next week for another issue of It Never Got Quiet. Mahalo.